Hi there. This is a talk about creating your own programming language, specifically a language that doesn't suck. And for many of us, the language that does not suck is the first language that we learned. And for me, uh, this was uh, the language that ran on this computer here, uh, the Apple IIe, which uh, was a computer that my parents gave to me in 1983. And I just took that picture today. It still works. And it runs a language called AppleSoft Basic. And you can still find documentation on AppleSoft Basic uh, to this day. So here's, for example, an introductory manual. And if you like look inside that manual, you can see what a basic program looks like. And you can see it consists of a bunch of lines. Every line has a line number. And on every line, there is a command. So it's none of that methods and classes and functions nonsense that we have today. It's just straight up do this, do that, jump to that line. And it was a lot of fun uh, during the day. So. Um, we're going to use the Racket system to implement that. And Racket is great. It's, a, it's an entire toolbox um, that you can use to create your own languages. It comes with many languages. Um, and uh, it's just a lot of fun. And if you want to uh, play with the code uh, for this talk you know, yourself, uh, I put everything on GitHub in a repository called Mike slash RC3. And that also links to a, a download link for, for Racket and has all the code for today. So anyway, I have to warn you, um, this talk is a, it's pretty heavy on code. So that's pretty much the only thing that I'm going to be doing is I'm going to write code in front of your eyes. Um, and if, if you know, that's just too much for you today, I'll, I'll, I understand and I won't be mad if you go see another talk. So, but if you're in for some really serious hacking, then this might just be the talk for you. So Racket, when it starts up, comes up with a blank screen, such as this one. Well, it's not quite blank. Uh, each file in Racket starts with a hash lang line uh, that tells Racket what language that file is written in. And the system actually comes with many, many languages, one of which also happens to be called Racket. Now, Racket's OK language, but uh, it also has some annoyances. So we could print something out by calling the display function. And if we run that program, well, down here, you can see the output. That's fine. But um, sometimes we also want to display several things. For example, a little bit of explanatory text along with a computation. So this here, uh, well, you can see that um, the default racket language is a Lisp dialect, which always has parentheses around compound forms um, and has an operator always in front. So you don't write you know, 1 plus 1. You write uh, the sum of 1 and 1. Now we really, well, we, hopefully we know what that should print out, but if we run that, we get an error message. And that's because display only takes a single argument to print out. And the second argument is supposed to be a port, which tells display where the output goes, if it goes to a file or uh, the REPL or whatever. So really, if we want you know, several pieces of output, such as this, then we need to put in several calls to display. So there you go. Um, well, that's super annoying, right? Um, and even, you know, AppleSoft Basic had that thing where you could just say print and you could just put in several things. So you could do this thing that we were trying to do with uh, display in the first place, right? But of course, you know, run this print. Uh, it's just not uh, built in in the shape that we would like. So we're just going to define it ourselves. And to do that, we're going to write a macro. Uh, which means that the this form with print at the front um, is going to get translated into code that Racket already knows about. And so we want to translate this into these two calls to display up here, right? Um, and uh, well, one restriction that we need to remember is that uh, you know a form always translates into a single form. So when there's two forms here in order to turn these uh, into a single form, we just put begin at the front and parentheses around. So this is the translation that we want. I'll comment that out just so that we um, have that at our disposal. And in order to write a compile time function or a macro, we say define syntax. We're going to define a new piece of syntax. And that piece of syntax always starts with open parent print. And the compile time function that implements the macro always gets called with an argument, which is exactly the piece of syntax that the compiler saw. Uh, and we're going to call that form. 
Now, in order to translate it into this begin form, we need to uh, take it apart a little bit, uh, identify the arguments. We need to parse it. Um, and for parsing, we will use a racket library called syntax parse. And uh, I'm going to import that as a library, so it's not a default feature in the core of racket language. And since uh, we, we're going to use syntax parse uh, inside a function uh, that runs at compile time or at syntax expansion time, um, as we like to say, uh, we're going to say up here for syntax. So we can use it inside a define syntax form. So we write you know, syntax parse here. We want to take apart this form thing, and we will write a pattern that describes the shape of the form. So we'll start with a very simple version of that pattern. Uh, so it starts with an open print, print, then there's an argument, and that argument has to be an expression, which is denoted by putting colon expression there. And now we want to translate that into a different piece of syntax. Uh, in order to create syntax, what we do is I put in hash backquote. We want to translate that into display arc for now. So we'll just do a single argument version um, for starters. So I'll put that here. I'll run the code. So there's nothing in the REPL now, but now I can say at least hello world. Oh, very exciting. Uh, and that works. But of course, it, it will only work with a single argument. We want to use it with several arguments. And in order to do that, we can just say, well, we don't just want one arc, we want several. And to do that, we put three dots here. Uh, almost looks too simple to be true. Uh, so it just says, well, there can be as many arguments as we want. And now, uh, as we said about, above, we need to translate into a begin form. So we want to say like this, right? And then we want to have as many calls to display as there are args. And we can also do that by putting you know, three dots here. And uh, Racket will automatically figure out that that means we should have one call to display for each argument. We can make sure that all the parentheses are closed. And uh, well, let's try that out. One plus one equals plus like this. And sure enough, that works. So uh, now we've added a new syntactic form to the racket language. It's pretty simple as it goes. And uh, we'll use that as a small building block for our uh, basic uh, machinery that we're going to implement next. So well, I guess it's a good time to save our work, uh, just to make sure that we're not losing anything. I'm just going to call this file basic.racket. And there we go. So, OK, uh, well, we got that print thing, which is similar to the print in basic, which is nice. But I don't know if you've ever used basic. It looks a basic program really looks like this, right? It says, you know, print hello world and then uh, uh, you can see that there's a line number in the beginning, and then you go something like, yeah, go to 10. So that's always the first program that just prints something uh, repeatedly. So um, yeah, well, this is obviously not there yet, right? Print, well, there's no line number. Um, there's also still the funny parenthesis syntax. So if you create, when you create a new language in Racket, the way to do that is, well, you um, you start with a parenthesized syntax, and later on top of that, we will impl implement the actual, you know, line-based uh, basic syntax that we might remember from our Apple II days. So, um, so to that end, we'll just start by saying, not you know, ten print. What we'll say, open paren ten print. Uh, you know, hello world. Um, Eventually, we're also going to have to take care of the um, lowercase print here and then say 20, you know, go to 10, something like this. Um, so that's what we're going to start with. Again, we have to think about how we will translate uh, this into code that Racket recognizes. And, uh, well, you know, this program, it doesn't do anything yet. Um, it just stores, um, you know, the print command, for example, it just stores that. Um, into uh, into the storage of the uh, of the Apple Soft interpreters, and the, I can then start the program by saying, "Well, I want to start the program at line 10, uh, or something like that." So, um, it's it's not enough to just sort of translate this into a call to print. We will also have to deal with the line numbers somehow, so that also go to 10, for example, makes sense. So, in order to store a piece of code, we can just give it a name in Racket, right? So, the idea is that we will translate it like this. We will say, well, we'll call We'll just define a function. We're just going to call that line 10. And uh, we will make that one call print. And 
uh, we will then define a function called line 20. And well, so go to, of course, in, in Racket um, doesn't exist, but we can just go to another function by calling it, right? So I'm just going to call line 10 here. And uh, well, you can already see that eventually this, this is hardly going to work as line 10 will never proceed to line 20. So eventually we will also have to put a call to line 20 here so that the code moves in the right direction. But we'll start simple. We're just going to start with a single line and then we don't need to call that next function. How does that work? Well, uh, we again say define syntax, right? And in this case, we're just going to define a piece of syntax that we're just going to call basic. Uh, again, it takes a, an entire form as its argument, and we'll start just with a single command. So I'm going to call syntax parse here, pass it the form, and say, well, basic. And the way basic commands work is there's a line number at the beginning, which is an integer, and then there is a command, which is in racket terms is just an expression. So, well, what do we need to do? Again, we need to translate it into another piece of syntax. So, um, well, we can see up there, right? We want to translate it into define, and then, uh, well, there's an open paren. We're going to have to cook up that line 10 name. Well, so we'll defer that problem for a little later. And we will just insert in here the command in the body of the function. So, okay, so that leaves the problem of computing the name line 10 from the line. So we want to compute that name by sticking that, you know, line minus in front. Um, and to that end, um, well, I want to call a function called uh, format it. And format it, well, uh, so it takes something that I'll explain in just a moment. It takes a pattern, which is sort of like a printf, uh, except, well, the pattern language is slightly different. So the tilde a says we should uh, insert something in here, and we want to insert the line number. Now, um, I'm kind of tempted to put in line number here. Now, uh, I need you to understand one thing is that, you know, a syntax, a piece of syntax that represents a number is not the same thing as the number itself. So, uh, for example, if the line number is 10, you know, down here in the REPL, I can type 10. Well, I get 10 as a result. But if I type this funny syntax thing, 10, then it says, well, there's a piece of syntax and it contains that number 10 in there. Um, if we want to stick it into the name, we really need the number 10. And in order to extract the sort of um, the, the actual uh, piece of data that is uh, uh, represented by the syntax, I can call a function called syntax e. So if I call syntax e of uh, you know, here, hash back row 10, then it gives me that 10. So really, uh, you know, that's what that line number is. So I need to call syntax e here. Moreover, uh, you can see here that I left three, three, dots here, three dots here. Format it also um, takes an argument that is called the syntactic context. Now, the macro system in Racket uh, has great sophistication when it comes to identifiers. Um, if, you, if you've seen uh, macro systems in other languages, such as in C, they're very simple about names. Um, and you can introduce name clashes um, um, very easily, and uh, Racket avoids that. Um, that's not going to be the main subject of this talk. Um, so suffice it to say that as the context, we want to define the line numbers sort of at the same level as uh, the basic form that appeared. So we'll just stick this here. Uh, so uh, just a little piece of magic here that we're just going to have to accept for the moment. So well, this thing, we want to stick that in here, right? Uh, in here where the three dots are. And to that end, I will just give it a name. I'll call that thing name. Um, and I want to stick it in here. Now, you have to understand a very subtle issue here, which is that, so for example, um, you know, when I have a pattern variable here that appears in the pattern, I can just stick that in the syntax. For example, here I can just put in command, and Rekel will figure out that I really meant this command here. Unfortunately, uh, well, it, I mean, there are reasons, but uh, this that does not work for this, which is a regular binding. It's not a pattern binding. And in order to tell Racket to, well, you know, stick the result of evaluating that, that piece of code here, I will need to put in hash comma name, which says, well, here's an expression, you know, stick, uh, stick the value of evaluating that expression in here. So that's 
I think that's confusing at, um, at first, but you'll get used to it. So remember, when there's something in here in the pattern, you can just stick it in here. And if you have regular bindings or if you have a piece of code um, that you want to stick in your syntax, you will need to prefix, prefix that with a hash comma, which is also called unquote. So let's see if that works. We'll run that. Um, ah, see here, I already ran into um, the first trap here that I just told you about. I called syntax E on the line number, but the same kind of, kind of goes in reverse. So if I can't just use a pattern variable in regular code, instead of instead, what I need to do is I need to prefix that pattern variable with hash backquote. Okay, so and then it knows, oh, okay, I need to look among the pattern variables um, for this. So if I run this, well, then it says format it. It doesn't know about that, and that's because format it in Racket is in a separate library. So I'm going to need to jump upwards a little bit and say here that for syntax, I don't just want syntax parse, I also want a library called Racket syntax, and that hopefully contains format it. Go back to that code press run and now at least it's silent and now well I could try doing that by saying basic you know 10 you know print hello world and doesn't do anything right as it should it should just stash that piece of code and but if I now uh, type this it executes that first line of code so hooray we've got a very basic basic version of basic here um, that works Okay, so now we have a single command in a basic program, but of course we want to have several of them. And so up here we already know how to do this, um, or at least how to tell syntax parse about this. We just put three dots here and says there can now be several lines in a, uh, in a basic form. So, um, but of course we need to translate that differently. Right now our expansion just has a single definition for a single line and now we need to expand that to do um, several definitions. So to that end, um, we, well, Racket is a functional programming language, we do a map. So we apply a function to all the line numbers and commands and the function always returns a piece of syntax for a single definition. Let's try that. So I'm going to say lambda here. Well, I'm going to put three dots here because there's a subtlety that I'll explain in just a moment. And now the question is, what do we map over? Well, we want to map over all, you know, all the line numbers and all the commands, of course. So if we have line number here, um, well, you know, it's not just one line number, right? It's several line numbers, one for each line in the program. So we always have to use it like this right, that we always put the three dots behind it, otherwise Racket will complain. And moreover, a uh, line number, again, is a pattern variable that comes from this line in the syntax parse form. So, uh, you know, the pattern variables, they really only work in this hash bang, uh, this hash uh, backquote form. So that's what we need to write. And um, also we do the same thing with the commands. And we're still not done because, well, you remember, you know, hash backquote returns a syntax object, but what we really need is a list because we're feeding that into map. So uh, Racket has a handy function that does that called syntax to list. Uh, also, here is syntax to list for the commands, and that allows us to map over, um, well, here are the line numbers and the commands. Now, you, you, now here's the subtlety. Um, suddenly, because we now have uh, line number and command be regular lambda parameters, they are no longer pattern variables. Okay, they're just regular p variables. And this, I think, really is the most subtle aspect of the of the Racket macro system. Is, so if you understand this issue, right, the pattern variables come from up here, and any, everything else, everything that is not here in a syntax parse uh, form in the, in the pattern part is not a pattern variable. So in this case, these are now regular variables and that means they should not appear in hash backquote anymore um, in this part where the line number is. And also means that uh, Racket is not just going to replace the pattern variable by the expansion down here with command. So I've got to push hash comma here. So if you figure that out, if you figure out that distinction, I think you'll be fine. So let's try that out. I'll run the program. Thankfully, there are no error messages. Uh, let's try again that um, basic program. Oh, ah, it complains again. There's another trap. Well, not a trap. Really, it's something that we've seen before. 
is map returns a list, and you can see here, so it says here, quote, open for n, that means it, it returned a list. Um, and uh, that means, well, map produced a list, but Racket really expects a syntax object. You know, if you're coming from Lisp or from Clojure, um, you expect sort of lists to be usable as syntax objects, but uh, Racket makes a strict distinction here, and it uses that distinction to track um, uh, source code locations to give you good error messages, and also to track uh, hygiene to keep track of lexical binding, which is not the main focus um, of this tutorial, but just so you know. So anyway, we need to definitely stick hash backquote here, and now we have several definitions, and because we have several definitions that we want to stick in one single form, we use begin, just like we did with print before. Just going to indent everything nicely. And of course, now we want to stick the result of evaluating this uh, in here. So I've got to put hash comma here. Okay. Um, and unfortunately, there's still another subtlety. If you look at the expansion here, you can see that it would, well, hopefully you can see that it would expand into something like this, right? You have begin, you know, from here. And then you have the open paren, which is from the list produced by map. And then inside those open parens are the definitions of the various lines, like, you know, line 10, line 20, and so on. Um, and you can see that there's one pair of parentheses too many. So we really don't want the racket macro expander to stick that list in there. We want it to stick the elements of the list one by one inside the begin. And to do that, we need to put a magic character here, also sometimes pronounced unsplicing. Uh, so, um, and that does exactly what we want. So it's it's just like hash, hash comma, but it expects a list and it will stick the elements of the list there, effectively removing one pair of parentheses. So let's try that again. Oops. Uh, so here's that basic form. At least it doesn't error out anymore. Let's see if we can start it. And it says, um, hello world. And we could also now extend it, right, and put another line here. Um, so right now we only know print. So uh, uh, do that. And um, so we can start line 10. And you can see that it well, line 10 runs, but really we expect the program to go on to line 20 after line 10. Line 20 is there, but uh, we haven't yet linked the lines together. So that's going to be our next problem. So what we need to do here is, well, after the command, you know, associated with the line happens, we need to stick in a call to the next line, right? Um, now, how do we get that call, right? In order to uh, produce the call for the next line, we need the line number of the next line, but we don't have it here. We just have the current line number. And uh, to do that, we'll, we're just going to map over an additional list, which is going to be like the original list of line numbers, but we'll shift it by one. So along with um, the current line number, there's always the next line number. And to that end, I'm going to call the, the Lisp function cutter, which just you know, removes the first element from a list. Um, and um, so that uh, that gives us that. And now, of course, map would complain because the lists do not do no longer have the same length, right? This list is one shorter. Uh, and so we need to append an element to make up for the lost element. And since there is no, um, since there is no line after the last line, I'm just going to pass false, right? This is racket syntax for false, hash f. And uh, we'll need to make sure that after the last line, we don't try to stick in a call. Okay, so um, here we are. Ah, we need to, of course, make sure that now that we're mapping over three lists and not just one, I need to add a, an additional parameter here, right? And now we could say call next line, and I could just, you know, stick in a call to format it like this, right? And, make, and then pass next line number. But that would be poor abstraction and, uh, well, it's kind of copy-paste code, so we could pull it out into its own function definition. That's a useful exercise. So I'm going to take that code, copy it one last time, stick it up here. Now there's two subtleties. Let me get rid of this obsolete comment here that we have to pay, pay attention to. So I'm going to call that function, you know, make line name. And of course, we need to pass in the line number, this thing here. But we need to pass in one more thing because this basic here that you see here, remember that it referred to this basic down here, 
right? It, it used to be here. But that's no longer in scope because we're outside of its parentheses. So we also need to pass it in as an argument. And we'll call that, let's call it the context. Uh, used by Racket to make sure that the definitions appear uh, in the right place and are referable um, by their name. Okay, so uh, we have this, great. Uh, and then we can take out those two calls here um, and, uh, and call make line name instead. Remember that we now need to call this basic thing that was there before and line number and the same thing uh, over here, uh, I'm sorry, it's called make line name. You probably noticed, <laughs> and we'll do the same thing here. Call it make line name. Uh, remove all the crud here. Let's duplicate it, and now we have a nice call. Of course, well, we'll we'll get to the fact that it's not a call yet in a moment, but also. I want you to think about one more aspect of macro expansion. This definition up here of make line name is just a regular procedure definition, but we want to call it from the macro expansion process. So essentially at compile time, we're at macro expansion time, but this is just a regular runtime function. It will not be available until runtime happens. And in order to tell Racket, no, this is a function, please make it available to macro expansion, we need to replace the define by define for syntax. So define it so it's available during syntax expansion. Okay, so one more thing. Um, this is of course not a call yet. Um, in order to have a call we need to have parentheses, the parentheses around the name of the next line. So I'm going to put do this and uh, put parentheses around it and then stick this in with hash comma, right? And that would be the call to the next line. Well, except it isn't quite, because remember, next line number can be false, right? And then we would not have um, the then then we would not have a function to call there. So we really need to make a case distinction here. I'm going to say, well, if there's a next line number, then this is a great function to call. This is the function of the next line, and if there isn't, well, I'm just going to call void, which is a function that does absolutely nothing that's built into Racket. Okay, let's try it out. Let's give it a whirl. Well, oh, it says next line number, ref reference to an unbound uh, uh, identifier. Ah, that's because I put a typo here. Let's try that again. Okay, now it at least goes through. Um, let's see, we had that program that had two lines in it. it. Doesn't error out, that's great. Call line 10 and, ah, okay, now it runs both lines. That's wonderful, but we see that we made a small mistake in the implementation of print. At least in, in Apple Soft Basic, when you call print, it prints a uh, return, uh, a new line at the end. So why don't, as a last act of this particular task, we go up here and stick up here a called a new line. That should work. Try that again. And now we get the output as we've wanted it from the beginning. So now we can have a sort of a, a basic program that has several lines where the lines are run consecutively. Uh, that's great. So what's next? Well, here we can already see what might be next, uh, which is the infamous go to command in basic, which just jumps to a to another place with no memory of where it came from or what was going on beforehand. So if we look at um, you know our, our code here, we can see that goto is going to require special treatment. We can't just implement it the way that we uh, implement it, that we implement print because of course when there's a goto there should not be a call to the next line after the goto that would make no sense because goto just transfers control directly. Now, um, well, things are getting a little bit unwieldy at this point uh, in this in this longish function here. So um, I will, put the code that translates a single command into a separate function. And we'll see how that goes. So here again, remember that we need to say define for syntax. So it's not a macro. It's a function that is called from a macro definition. I'm going to call that function translate command. And um, well, so we pass in the, um, we pass in the actual uh, command. So that's the, that's, if you will, the original source code from the basic program. Uh, and we need to translate that into racket code. And um, well, and the idea is that we uh, use translate command to produce the body 
of this function here. So um, of course that means we need to also pass in call next line. So let's see, let's pass that in. Great. And uh, for now, we're just going to keep that very simple. We're just going to uh, going to keep the definition from up here. Now, again, remember that when we produce syntax, we can only produce a single form at a time. So there are two forms here, but uh, we know we can always combine two forms into one by sticking a begin in front. So we'll just do the abstraction for now without adding additional functionality. So instead, we will say, OK, translate command f command and call next line and omit this. Do what way with that. Make sure that all the parentheses line up. Um, yeah, it's getting getting to be a lot of parentheses and see if that works. So run that and you know program runs as before. That's great. So we want to give go to special treatment. And in order to do that, well, we need to ins inspect the command here and see, well, if, if it's a go to command, then we give it this treatment. In all other cases, we just translate to the code that we already have. So I call syntax parse, call pass the command. And now I put here a pattern where it says, well, if it's a go to command, it looks like this go to, there's a line number, and that line number is an integer. Then I'm going to do one thing. And in all other cases, I want to do something else. And you can see here that, you know, this is now a syntax parse that has several clauses and it just tries them in order with the compiler while it does syntax expansion. First tries the first one, then the second one. The first one that matches um, gets to be run. And this thing here is just a wildcard pattern that matches anything that you want. So that's the fall through clause at the end. Okay, so in this case, well, we have go to. Now, here's another subtlety. In order, we really want the word go to to appear there, but remember that syntax parse does pattern matching. So, whenever there's a name here, uh, that name is just going to match whatever is there in the input. It's a really subtle issue. And we really want the word go to to appear here. And uh, another subtle issue is that we want that to be consistent with uh, the rest of the binding structure of the program. We'll ignore that here. Uh, but in order to do that, we need to put something like this, a magic clause here at the beginning that says, well, go to whenever it appears here means that we really want the word go to to show up there. So for all of our specially treated commands, we need to put that uh, in, we, put the, we need to put the name of that command into the literals clause up here. Okay. So now when there's a go to, we don't, you know, we just want to generate a call to um, the procedure that's associated with that line number. And we get the name of that procedure by saying make line name. Um, well, and remember, make line name now needs that context argument up here. And we don't have it here. So we need to add another parameter, call that context. Up here, we pass basic. Um, and uh, OK, got that here. And then we can call make line name with context and the line number. OK, so got that here. And that's just the name of the procedure. We still need to make a piece of syntax with a call to it. So we put hashbang backquote, put a pair of parentheses. And in the middle, we need to put hashbang comma to actually stick that name there. OK, well, let's see if it does anything. Oh. Error message. Well, <laughs> again, I fell into the same trap that I always fall into. Line number here is a pattern variable, so it really is only valid inside a hashbang backquote. Well, it is inside a hashbang backquote, but the hashbang comma kind of undoes that. It's a, so we refer to it as a regular variable here. In order to refer to a pattern variable, again, we need to put hashbang backquote here. So um, it must seem confusing at this point, but um, if you just do a bunch of stuff with macros, you will soon get the hang of that, I think, and then you'll recognize the uh, the error message. Right here it says pattern variable cannot be used outside of a template. So line number is a pattern variable. Now we can see, oh, that nicely, uh, that occurrence here of line number nicely refers to that one. Let's see if it runs now. Okay. See if we can do this. Um, so, uh, well, here's a rule that I forgot about, but fortunately it's easy to remember because there's an error message that says literal is unbound in phase zero, right? Uh, phase zero has to do with the phase zero's runtime. Uh, 
don't have to worry about that too much, but it just means that go to has no definition that it refers to. And we're not interested in a definition because we're translating calls to go to into something else anyway. So I'm just going to say put an, a dummy definition here to false. And that just means if there's any reference to that go to, then, um, you know, syntax parse will recognize it. Let's oops, push the wrong button there. Let me try again. Um, and well, at least it doesn't error out. Let's see if we can run the program. And um, that's pretty neat. And now, well, I guess it's time that um, I put an actual basic program here into the source code so I don't have to keep retyping it like this. Um, you know, like, like this, for example. And well, how are we going to see that it works? I'm just going to put a line 20 there that says go to 40. Uh, make that line 30 and put line 40, which says, uh, you know, the end, right? So that we know the program is done. Let's see if that works. We could call line 10 and indeed it says hello world the end and it skips hello again. So go to works now. All right, what's next? Well, we can just keep adding commands, right? But of course, some cause more trouble than others. And one that causes a little bit of trouble is um, assignment, right? We can have variables in basic. It might look like, well, in basic, it would look like this, right? A equals 42. And, um, you know, that would well, establish a variable called A, and we could then use it, right? We could say, something like this. And um, I'm going to use a syntax slightly different. So of course it has to be parenthesized. The operator has to be in front. So it might look like this. And I'm going to use colon equals to avoid confusion with the, uh, with the uh, equal sign without a colon, uh, which is the equality operator. Okay. So we'll just use the same technique um, that we used before. So I'm going to just like go to, right? It needs to be a literal. We want uh, another case to match only when there's an actual colon equal sign there. Well, here's a variable and that has to be an identifier. That's how we talk, uh, tell syntax parts that it needs to be an identifier. And then there's a right hand side, which can be any expression that we want. Okay, so got this here. And now we just need to generate a piece of code that works with it, right? And in uh, in Racket, variable assignment happens with an operator that's called set bang. So the exclamation mark is pronounced bang to denote that there is an evil side effect happening here. So, uh, and we can just use these two pattern variables. We can just use the right hand side here. And, ah, okay. Well, remember that trick that we needed here with go to, we need it with colon equals two. So we need to provide a dummy definition. And now, well, here's a little problem, right? It says um, A is an unbound identifier down here. And that's because, well, uh, Racket distinguishes between uh, binding an identifier. So you're establishing that the identifier exists and then changing uh, the value in the storage cell associated with that identifier. Those are two separate things, right? And uh, so we could make that error message go away by saying, you know, define A to some dummy value. Uh, but then, of course, that's no longer basic, right? It's um, um, if we would need that additional definition in basic, we can just introduce an identifier by doing an assignment to it. So somehow we need to generate the set of uh, variables that appear in assignments and make sure that we also um, uh, generate definitions for those identifiers, dummy definitions at the beginning. So, well, we need to generate those definitions. And for generating those definitions, we need the set of variables that are uh, in a program. And we'll start by just collecting the variables that are in a single command. And to that end, I'm just going to uh, define a new function here. I'm going to call that collect variables, and I'm going to pass in the command. Okay. And well, not just the command, but uh, we will want to collect a list uh, or rather a set of those variables because of course a variable might occur in several assignments. So we will use something called an id set. And we'll define that in a minute. Uh, so uh, Racket comes with a library that allows you to manage uh, sets of these identifiers. And uh, we will need to import that library up here. So call that syntax, that's called syntax it set. And that allows us to uh, deal with those 
sets. Okay, and, and of course we need to look inside those commands. So we're just going to use the same syntax parse, essentially the same syntax parse that we had up here, right? So we have various um, literals here. With go to, of course, there can't be any variables uh, introduced by go to. We're mainly interested in the clause uh, that has to do with assignments. And, um, well, how does that work? So in that case, what we need to do is we need to say uh, free it set add and uh, call it set and add the variable here. And anything else, well, we're not going to do anything. I'm just going to call void the function, the built-in function that doesn't do anything. Okay. Okay, and now we need to call that function collect variables um, for each command. And we need to do that up here from the basic form, right? Where we have all the commands at our disposal. So first of all, we need to create an empty it set that we can add to. Call that it set. And so we're going to call a function. It's got a cumbersome name, mutable it set. Oh, and not just that, mutable free it set, because uh, again, Racket makes a subtle distinction between uh, identifiers depending on whether they're free or bound. Don't worry about that. Um, this, this is going to work. And then what we do is, well, we want to call collect variables on each command and passing in that it set. And But remember, we don't just have a single command. We have a whole list of them. And so we need to do this. Well, um, we take that command dot 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 and of course need to wrap that hash back quote around it, convert that into a list. We've done that before. And then we can use a built-in function called for each, which just calls um, this function on every argument, on every element of that list, right? It's sort of like map, but um, that returns you a list of the result, whereas for each just doesn't bother with the results and throws them away. So now we have a set of identifiers. We just need to generate definitions from it, and these definitions need to go here, right, before the actual code for the basic program. So again, we can use map, right, to map all over all the variables. We'll We'll figure out in a moment what we're going to do with those. And, uh, well, we'd like to map over its set. Unfortunately, its set is not a list, and map wants a list. So we are going to use a function called free its set to list to make it a list, right? And so for each variable, we want to generate a dummy definition. Again, we need to generate a piece of syntax. It says define. We stick that variable in, and we'll just define it to false uh, to make sure that things don't get mixed up with regular basic values. Okay. Now remember again, I mean, you can see here the other call to map, right? We want to make sure that this gets spliced into um, that form here. So again, I call that, I, I use that same funny magic thing here, hash comma at, uh, which splices all those definitions into that begin form. Okay. Well, let's see if that works. And now it says, ah, oh, that variable is already defined. That's a good sign because you can't have several definitions for a single variable. So we put one in ourselves. So I'm going to delete that. And um, OK. And now we can see that there is a variable here, right? It's bound to false, as it should be. And let's try running the program. Uh, well, not much happens. Why is that, right? Why does the program not produce anything? Well, we could look at A. A is now 42. Let's see. Let's go up here, and we can see here the translation of uh, colon equals, and you see, you can see I forgot something. Uh, this just sets the variable, but it does not go on with uh, the program as um, the rest does. So we need to put a begin here, and then put in the call to the next line. Let's see if that works. And now line five, and that actually prints out the value of that variable. So now we've got variables in our program. That's wonderful. Next up are conditionals in BASIC. So how does that work? Well, BASIC has a statement called the if statement. It might look like this, right? We compare A with 42. It's kind of silly. We know what the result is, but just to demonstrate the feature. And then depending on whether that's true or false, we could, whatever, set B to 1 or set B to two, and we'll just print that out along with the A here, just so we know what came out. 
All right, well, we need to translate the if command, of course. Um, so we need to go up here into our translate command function. We need to add if here to the list of literals so we can recognize ifs. And it looks like this. Well, we have some test, that's an expression. We have a then branch, that's an expression. And we have an else branch, that's an expression. And, well, we're just going to translate it into rackets if, but we need to make sure that the then branch and the else branch also get translated. So we use hash back quote. Again, you know, this is not the same if as here. This is now rackets if. We're just going to leave test as it is. And then we call translate command. And remember, we need we want the result of translate command stuck in there. So we need to put hash comma in front. Uh, pass in some context. You know, again, you know, we need to pass a pattern variable here, so we need to put hash back quote in front, and we'll pass call next line as before. And do the same thing here. Translate command, context, uh, and call call next line. Okay. Well, let's try running it. Well, it doesn't work, right? We get an error message that says B is unbound. Why is that? Well, we're generating definitions for all the variables that occur, but we, um, but so far we're only looking at assignments that occur at the top level. We're not looking inside an if, so we need to make sure that we also extend collect variables in the same way that we extended uh, translate command. So we also need to add that to the list of um, literals here and just put the same. We can just copy the pattern from up here. Copy that here. And uh, well, we just need to call collect variables recursively on the two branches, right? So we call collect variables on uh, then with the it set, and we call collect variables with the else on the it set. Well, let's see if it gets any better. Well, at least it doesn't error out. Uh, show up our program again. We could call it starting at line number five. And, oh, that's not bad. So we now see the, it says prints the number one, which comes from this assignment here, right? And uh, so B is assigned to one if A is 42 and A is indeed 42. We could also, I don't know, set it to 41. Try that again, line five. And we see that it now prints A2 because the branch went the other way. I'll just change that back and save. Great. So we'll add one more feature uh, that's actually not just one command but we'll need three commands and that is basic subroutines. Um, so well, how, what could that look like? For example in line 1000 we could say we're just going to print the B variable and then in line 1010 we just put a return statement. So AppleSoft Basic doesn't have functions in the way that we know them uh, or methods, uh, it just has these subroutines. And so we could call, we could um, output B by just saying, you know, whatever, line 8 here, and we could say go sub line 1000 like this. And the idea is then that it will go and print B, right, and, um, and return and go on after that with hello world and and whatnot. We could also call it several times, of course. Um, okay, and yeah, we'll just leave it like that, two commands. Okay, so go sub and return. What should we do? Well, we go up here, and obviously we need to do something with translate command. We will just add go sub and return. And these are not built into rackets, so we need to have go sub false to dummy definitions for them uh, to do that. And so how does that work? Well, go sub is kind of like go to, except the program goes on, right? So, well, there's go sub, line number, which is an integer. And of course, well, we need to generate a call just as we do with go to, right? Uh, so I'm going to put, well, I'm just going to duplicate that from up here. And the only difference is after that call is done, right, when that finishes, then um, after that is done, we need to continue with the next line. Unfortunately, we know how to do that because we've got the call to the next line sitting up here. So I just stick call next line here, 
So that's the only difference between go to and go sub. And of course, we also need to implement return. And well, what happens with return? Uh, with return, nothing happens. Also, return is, is similar to go to and go sub in that it doesn't go to the next line. It just returns. And uh, when there's an active go to, it will just um, uh, go back to the line after that. It will go to that call to call next line here. Let's see if that works. Okay, so at least we don't get an error message. Line five. And, well, how do we interpret that output? I kind of forgot what the program was. Well, here it said go sub 1000, it printed B, and then it went on with the program as before. Uh, arguably, the program should finish here after line 40 and before line 1000, but I'll leave that for you as an exercise to implement. So now we have enough basic there to at least uh, give us a fair idea of how to do this whole thing and maybe how to add the rest. And I promised that we would also get actual basic syntax and we only have a few minutes left. So let's get to it. In order to do that, we need to make sure that the functionality that we've implemented in this file is available in other files. And so we need to uh, add what's called a provide form. That's like an export or public uh, annotation or something like that. And we just need to provide the basic form that we implemented, the print command that we implemented, go to, you know, all those things that we added to implement our basic syntax return. There we go and save that file. And then we're done with that part. Now, for the actual basic syntax, um, there's no way around writing a proper parser. And we don't have nearly enough time to do that. It's not that hard, but it takes a little bit of time. Uh, so I've prepared the code to do that. It's just called uh, a reader. So here's a file called basicreader.racket. And if I run that, well, I, you can see here, for example, there's a function called parse line. It takes two arguments. One of them is called zerts. Um, that's just context information about uh, what file this code resides in and so on. I'm just going to pass false here. Um, later, that uh, value will be provided by the racket system. And the other argument is uh, an input port, which is just a reference to an open file uh, or something like that. But we can also use a string by just saying open input string here. So if I say, you know, 10 print a plus one and call that function, you can see that it returns list structure that corresponds exactly to um, you know, the syntax that we, the parenthesized syntax that we implemented earlier. We just need to hook this up to the rest of the racket system. And for that, we need to write a little boilerplate function. I'm going to call that basic read syntax. Uh, it also takes a zerts and an in argument. And that function calls parse program, which does the same thing as parse line, but for an entire program. Uh, do this. And we want to embed the result of that um, in uh, something that Racket will later understand. So do that and we need to create uh, a module declaration for Racket. I'm just going to call that module basic. My name doesn't particularly matter. Uh, it imports the Racket language and it also requires, so it imports the code that we've just written, which is in the racket.rkt file. And now, uh, here's the re result of parsing the program. We still need to put a basic form around it and splice in the result of parsing the program. So that's that. Now, you might have noticed that the back quote up here and the comma at here doesn't have a hash with it. It doesn't create syntax structure. It just creates an ordinary uh, racket list structure. We still need to convert it to a syntax object. And for that, we use a function called datum to syntax. And uh, just pass false here for the context. Um, that's enough. Make sure that all the parentheses line up. And um, then we're good to go. Well, almost good to go. We still need to export this uh, function. And we need to have a different, quite slightly different name for it. We're just going to call it read syntax on export. And that's a magic name that Racket will later recognize. So um, I'll save that file. And then we are good to go. So in order to try this out, I've uh, prepared another little example file called basic demo syntax.rkt. This is what it looks like. And you can see the hash line, lang line up here declares that we want to use the reader that we just uh, implemented, you know, basic reader.rkt. And what follows is a very much AppleSoft looking program. And uh, well, I can run that by just typing line 10, like we used to do that. And we can see that it pretty much works. So 
there you have it. I mean, Applesoft is just about as different from usual Racket as it can be. And so if you can do that, then you can implement just about any language you like with the Racket system. And it's not just for toy stuff. It's a great tool for organizing your software architecture, uh, for just generally generating a pleasant notation, uh, for doing things like documentation in the Racket system. Uh, there's lots of publications and lots of examples on that. Um, and of course, we've implemented the same, we've used the same machinery to also implement teaching languages and to iterate quickly, um, improving those languages. So I hope this has motivated you to try out uh, the Racket system. Again, uh, please check out um, the GitHub repository if you want to look at the code or send me email or contact me some other ways if you're interested in this stuff. And I'm looking forward to your question and a little bit of discussion. We'll see. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mike, for the talk and to for introducing us to Racket uh, and to show us how to implement a, a language there. Uh, I already saw there was already quite some discussion in the <laughs> chat, but we have uh, still some questions for everyone. And uh, we start with a question from, uh, from someone. And... <laughs> And uh, the question is why you use these macros instead of simple functions? Uh, because he thinks you can also use just functions to in, uh, to produce print. Yeah, so that question was asked just after I introduced print, right? So it doesn't refer yeah. to all the rest that we did there. And indeed, yeah. print could be a simple function, um, but um, and, and indeed, there's a lot of things that can just be functions and don't need to be macros in, in Racket, um, but, and, and print is one of them. But then I couldn't have used it to demo a single, a simple macro, right? The, all the other macros that I introduced are a lot more uh, complicated, so I figured I'd do a simple one first. Very good. Uh, let's go on. Um... There are all the differences between bindings and operators. Uh, it would be uh, operators to quote unquote. It would be something I wouldn't. S uh, it would be great if you showed them more in detail, but that's more a comment. Yeah, um, so so it is a little bit confusing that there's two kinds of variables, right? And I hope uh, throughout the talk there's enough of them that you can uh, see what the difference is. Uh, the reason for that is in that um, this is sort of a, an, an expert level macro system that we're using there. And the simple macro system that's in Racket, um, the construct for that is called syntax rules knows only pattern variables. So if you deal only with syntax rules, then it's very simple. But if you want to write more complicated macros like the ones that we did, then uh, you naturally sort of incur both the pattern variables and the regular variables. Um, but it, there's only these, these two kinds, right? And you get, you get the hang of it by playing around with it some. Then there's a comment by Sneronia uh, who says all the switching between uh, hash uh, backquote and hash kind of reminds her of existing and entering math mode in LaTeX. Yeah, that, that's that's a <laughs> that's a great analogy, I think, right? In 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 in, in LaTeX, when you put a dollar sign, you enter this different syntax, uh, this different world there, and then you can exit that again by writing, you know, backslash text rm or something like that. That's exactly uh, that's exactly the same uh, the same idea that you have uh, that you have in Racket, right? Is that you enter the syntax construction mode and that you exit it to regular code, and then you can re-enter it. Uh, so you kind of can pop 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 push push push. Um, you know, like the like the infinite turtles, I guess. The next question is uh, if there is if you have control over the runtime of your language within Racket. Yeah, so I see the question goes on a little bit uh, that uh, yeah. and, and suggests that memory management might be a subject. So. Um, 
so Racket gives you great control over the runtime because it has one of the most flexible runtimes in existence. It might be the, the most flexible uh, one in existence, um, specifically when it comes to control structures. Um, so, so macros is one aspect of the flexibility of Racket. Another one is that it has something called delimited control, which allows you to, um, to implement exceptions, to implement threading, all kinds of things in terms of the primitive constructs of the language. Um, it does not give you control over memory management uh, directly. I mean, you can influence the way that it deals with memory a little bit. Um, it does not give you control whether it's interpreted or compiled, but if you want an interpreted language, you just write an interpreter. So I guess it, it gets you control over that. But uh, there's a great many examples that come with a racket language and its package ecosystem of different languages. So uh, uh, one example is that there's a Haskell-like um, uh, language, for example, that comes, oh, the only difference is that it has parentheses. Um, or um, I think the racket-based system comes with a language that does functional reactive programming, where each value changes over time. You can see it change live in the REPL. Um, the next question is from Decoder. Did you implement a whole basic interpreter in Racket, and how does it compare in speed with a more traditional interpreter? Uh, so, well, I implemented a bit more than I showed, but I didn't, you know, I didn't put the, the all the features of AppleSoft Basic and the graphics in there. You notice because it's implemented in macros, though, it is a compiler effectively. So it gets compiled into Racket code, and I think it would compare quite favorably because Racket has a pretty pretty efficient compiler um, in the in the back seat there. Um, so so. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's not apples to oranges, it's kind of apples to 40-year-old prunes. So, um, so and, and Racket obviously doesn't run on an Apple II, um, but I think the Apple, the, the Apple software, the basic implementation that you're getting there is, is going to run quite fast, actually. The next question is from Prolis. Uh, do you think Racket with its extensive macro system is particularly well suited for building languages? Mm -hmm. yeah, so it is the best system in the world to build languages, right? And when, uh, so in, when in my commercial work, right, whenever we need to design a DSL, then uh, Racket is at least involved in the prototyping stage, uh, and it could very well be involved in the, in the production stage as well. Specifically, you've noticed that Racket is a Lisp uh, descendant, I guess, in many ways. And, um, and of course, if you get a more traditional Lisp like Clojure, it also has a macro system, but the macro systems of traditional Lisps are significantly less powerful than the one in Racket. And there's two differences that are relevant. Um, one of them is that um, the, the syntax in traditional Lisp often doesn't track source code information, so you don't really get good error messages, which are important if you really have domain-specific languages that are exposed to domain experts. And the other one is that it deals with hygiene. We didn't talk about this in the talk because there's lots of other talks and papers um, on the topic of hygiene. Uh, but you know that sometimes when you uh, write a macro, you need to invent new names that are just supposed to be temporary. And, um, and doing that requires extreme care in a traditional Lisp system, whereas in Racket, it's just automatic. Um, and so, pretty much the subtleties that I've shown, um, that's a pretty complete set. I don't think I deal with more subtleties uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and in a traditional Lisp system, you would also need to deal with hygiene issues, which you don't in Racket. So, um, so that gets you sort of one level of power above traditional Lisps in, in terms of uh, how funky you can get with your DSL. <laughs>